of soil health. And of course, the Secretary of State should be massively congratulated. I do agree with uh, Patrick. It is great to be working with a big hitting politician who can finally put uh, the importance of farming, the environment and food production very firmly on the political map. Um, but I want to start with, with what I refer to as a sort of foundation. Um, where, where do we start the sort of Brexit journey from? Um, because I think it's quite easy to think that actually it, it's pretty black and bleak out there, and it's not. Um, had we had this conversation 20 years ago, I think it would have been very different, because I think uh, the food and farming sector, let alone the environment, was in a, a very, very different place. Um, and where we are now, and looking at that journey, where we just on the way over here, I drove here, was in Brussels first thing this morning, flew over, landed in Birmingham, and drove from Birmingham uh, to here this morning, and seeing all the hedges that have been planted. You know, we have planted 30,000 kilometres of hedges in the last 20 years. We've created 27,000 uh, kilometres of grass margins. Uh, in the last 20 years, and I, I won't name who, but I was having a conversation not that long ago with a government minister, and this is why I'm so pleased that Michael is in the position, who said, you know, it's great now, Brexit's brilliant, we can bring all that land back into production that surrounds our fields. And I said, do you mean our, our prized agri-environment schemes? And uh, is that what they are? And that is one of the challenges that we face. You know, we know what we're doing, but who else does? And this is why I feel so strongly about taking the countryside to the town, having a far more open conversation around what we're actually doing. Um, but of course, it, it doesn't end there. Um, we are actively maintaining 2,700 kilometres of stone walls. Um, and when we look at farming and targeting our practice, the last 20 years have seen us halve our use of pesticides. It's seen us halve our use of inorganic fertiliser. We've lowered our greenhouse gas emissions by 17%. And I think a very interesting one, and it is a core government ambition. David Cameron was determined to be a global leader on antimicrobial resistance. So where do we sit uh, in the league table on that? Well, the global league table is to be making sure that our usage is below the 50 mg per kilogram. And we are well below. Indeed, our broiler production in the UK currently sits at 17 mg per kilogram. And if you just benchmark that against the United States, a lot of talk about chlorinated chicken. Forget the chlorinated chicken. That is not the issue. It's all about the method of production. And of course, in the United States, they're using 58 mg per kilogram. Um, so a great success story for UK farmers. Again, who knows about it? Um, and of course, a third of all farming businesses have diversified into green energy. Um, when we look at food costs, you know, we've had a lot of talk with Brexit about, you know, Brexit's great because we're going to have cheaper food. And I think we really have to acknowledge the journey that we've been on. In the 1970s and 1980s, we were spending 30% of our annual income on food. That is down to 12% of annual income right now. Um, the red chapter, another thing that's happened in the last 20 years is the rise of assurance schemes demanded by consumers. So we now have the Soil Association, we have LEAF accredited, we have RSPCA accredited, and we have red chapter assurance currently on £30 billion pounds worth of British food. So what I'm trying to say is we start this from a good place. We start Brexit with solid foundations underneath us. Um, this has been a sort of baseline slide, if you like, for our, our 50 consultations that we've done across England in preparation for health and harmony. I, I had actually a more shocking, uh, well, it's not a more shocking statement, but one farmer came up to me and said, I've Googled health and harmony, and it's a tanning salon in Essex. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure that, that, that definitely didn't start life in Defra. Uh, but, you know, the powers of Google, you, you're going to find something somewhere, aren't you? Um, but this is, this is the, the, the mission, really. We, we want to see a future that is about active farming businesses, that is about people that are the risk takers out there. Um, we want it to be sustainable, profitable and progressive. Um, we want to meet the needs of the market and society. And we want to deliver for all incomes. This is hugely important to me. We have to remember that 50% of UK consumers are in a real austerity challenge at the moment. 
And on average, those consumers have £85 to spend per week on a family of four. So there is an austerity challenge out there. It can't all be about deliciously Ella. And we've got to be able, as farmers and growers, to provide to all incomes in the country. No one should be a disadvantage from buying high quality, nutritious, traceable, affordable British food. Um, but we do believe that the UK food system should have an enhanced reputation at home and abroad. And I'm delighted that the Secretary of State has an ambition to bring a food policy uh, to life, because I don't think we've ever needed a bigger, bolder plan for food production than we do today. Um, we are the producer of whole foods. I do think, you know, we haven't had this, this bigger conversation nearly enough. And the importance now of things like food security. We are an island nation, 65 million people. Um, I've had a lot of farmers saying to me, you know, why doesn't it say in Health and Harmony that food is public good? Well, you know, the truth is, and any economist will tell you, food is not a public good. But food security is a public good. And actually, as Ian Wright is constantly reminding me, and I know constantly reminding uh, the Secretary of State, um, feeding a country is the most important thing. If you cannot feed a country, you haven't got a country. Um, I was reminded when we had the last round of snow in my little village of Downton and the local co-op, um, a lot of young people, uh, under 30, I would say, um, really, really angry. Uh, there was no milk, there was no bread, for four days, and they were incensed. And of course, it's only when you get to, to uh, there are a lot of younger people in the audience, but I can honestly say that I remember those times when we ran out of, of bread and milk. But a lot of people don't, and they expect food availability to be there 24 seven, and it is. Um, it's readily available 24 seven, but do we take it for granted? I think we can all say that yes, we probably do. Um, you look at the ownership of wheat stocks now, and, and you look at the, um, the rising focus in production of Russia, um, now risen to 90 million tonnes of production, up from 65 million tonnes of production. You look at China, that never sells any wheat at all, and you look at the situation going on in the US uh, with President Trump and a sort of protectionist trading regime. So the world is changing. We live in a volatile world, and the UK now has the opportunity as we sever our long-term relationship with Europe to take a, a different look, if you like, at self-sufficiency and food security and what that means. And I just want to touch briefly on a Royal Society paper um, that made the point that we are importing 50% of our food and 50% of our animal feed, meaning that we're offshoring 70% and 64% of associated cropland and greenhouse gas emissions impacts. Um, you know, we've always, within the NFU, been absolutely proud to source out of a global food larder. There are many things that we cannot grow and shouldn't try to grow in the UK. But I think the disappointment for UK farmers is where we see production fall or stand still in those products where we can compete and we have a natural advantage. And that is the opportunity now to really make sure, um, as I said, profitable, progressive, and sustainable businesses. But this is a new deal. You know, I think we have to be very, very clear. The NFU has never got involved with telling farmers how to farm. If we are now expecting a new investment from the UK taxpayer, it's got to be going to efficient businesses. You know, we have never, as a country, propped up inefficient businesses, and we should not expect to see that now. So we do want to see efficient businesses, we do want to see competitive businesses, we do want to see businesses that are recognised by society. Now those of you, my eyesight's really bad and I said sort of mid-tier and I could, I could see this. Sorry, the ones at the back, you, you won't be able to probably see uh, the infographics on here. But really, it's just for society saying that actually we do all have a right to have affordable and healthy food for every citizen. It must be accessible, attractive, and wildlife-rich landscapes. A public that's connected, enthused, and confident about British food. An assured UK food sustainably produced and reared. You know, that has to be part of the offer from farmers for society. But of course, at the top, in the middle of all of this, sits 
the government uh, has a, a massive opportunity uh, to, to shape the future. And I guess within living memory, there have been two hugely defining moments. Uh, one being the Act of 1947, the last Agricultural Act, and the next in 1973, where we joined the European Union. And this is the third in line within living memory of really defining moments for our future. But this is actually um, the graph uh, taken out of the Health and Harmony <coughs> paper and it, it very clearly shows um, the, the challenges we face. And you heard the Secretary of State actually talk about the challenges for upland farming. But you can see, looking at lowland livestock here, there's almost a greater challenge. You've got a, a, a lower level of ag environment support there. Um, you've got a slightly lower level of direct support. Um, and when you look at taking direct support away, you can see that you've got quite a major challenge. Now, one of, the, one of the opportunities and one of the challenges for the UK is we have a lot of areas that just go grass. Um, so I've often said to Helen Browning, who I think is, well, I know she's here today, um, you know, she and I are incredibly lucky where we farm in Wiltshire. We've got all sorts of business choices. We could grow whatever we wanted. That's not the same for every part of the UK. Many parts of the UK only grow grass and have production methods that are reliant on beef and sheep. So we're not feeding the world's grain supplies to our livestock. We are a very extensive base system, but we've got to be really mindful of it. And we've got to really look at this to analyse where we start Brexit from. Um, you can see horticulture up the top there. 24% of farm gate value sits within horticulture. We haven't seen one single price rise in fruit and vegetables in the last 15 years. Now, that's been a phenomenal success for the British consumer, but that's been a massive challenge for our growers to remain competitive. Um, for me, they've been one of the most innovative sectors. They've been totally market focused, but they are farming in really challenging times. And of course, 70 percent. Uh, of their costs was, is within labour. Um, rightly so, government has taken a very strong line on social regulation, national living wage, business rates, all of which puts more pressure on. And when you cannot push those costs up the line, the grower has to absorb it. So it just shows that the baseline for where we start this, this process from. Um, I guess uh, pigs and poultry looked really quite, quite good on that graph beforehand, the impact for them is getting the right trade deal. Um, and when we look at consumption, I, I found it quite extraordinary, actually. Do you know we eat 29 kilograms per person in the UK of poultry meat? 29 kilograms. It seems like a, a lot of poultry meat. Guess what they eat in Australia? 50 kilograms per person. So poultry meat is, is hugely important protein. Um, it's been a very integrated approach. It's been a, a protein that has really been able to produce to all incomes. So you've got huge opportunities of scale for what you can eat. But it's all about the trade deal for pigs and poultry. Um, and huge opportunities for our arable farmers making sure that actually we're not reliant on imports to feed our pig and poultry sector. Have I got to hurry up? Really hurry up. Okay. Very quickly, these have got to have a shared ambition. Um, it's got to be done uh, together. We've separate them at our absolute peril. And I want to be very, very clear. Uh, there should be no part of the UK farm area where environment is not a significant consideration uh, for farmers. Um, you know, that is, I think, absolutely paramount. I'll, I'll move on quickly. Um, Brexit doesn't change everything. You know, these are hugely, hugely important areas. Um, two days in Brussels talking about Horizon 2020. Should we still be part of it? R&D, yes, of course we should. You know, there are areas where, where that link should remain and we should be looking to the future. Accessing uh, new technology, innovating, making sure uh, that we are securing our borders from disease and pests. They are all hugely important. None of that changes. And just in very briefly, in conclusion, um, this is our thinking on, on what a new policy should look like. It's very much um, based, uh, we get into Venn diagrams, 
at the moment. I had a great conversation with the Swiss government and they were saying, oh, you've got a Venn diagram. And I said, yes, we feel it's very important, or a three-legged milking school, depending on how you want to look at it. And she said, yes, we, we started um, with a house. And I said, gosh, so did we. We started with a house too. And she said, yes, we've kept our house and not got a Venn diagram. So it's however you want to talk about this and shape it going forwards. But these three elements are, are crucial, we believe, uh, to the future. Productivity, the most misunderstood word of our time. Productivity is not about randomly producing more. Productivity is about smarter farming that is impacting less. And if you benchmark us against Denmark, probably one of the most environmentally sensitive countries in the world, uh, we are showing levels of productivity at 0.9% and Denmark is at 3%. So productivity is crucial to achieving for the environment. What's my take home message? My take home message is that this is a great opportunity. We have a great Secretary of State to be our ambassador. Um, we want to be able to produce food in this country for all incomes. We want British food to be wanted across the world. Um, most of all, I guess, for the farmers in the room, we want profitability uh, restored to the farming sector. It is crucial. Um, that the new ambition makes sure that we are trading fairly. Um, that's a massive challenge. When I mentioned about fruit and veg, we've got many dairy farmers on pretty shocking contracts. And a crucial part to farming with less or potentially no direct support must be achieving UK fair trade. Um, I will end there and, and open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minette. Um, Minette has uh, agreed that because the Secretary of State has to go, I think, well, shortly after three, uh, that we will focus our questions uh, with him um, until he leaves, and then Minette will have more airtime afterwards. Uh, may I invite you to uh, raise questions, but please make them sharp and punchy and to the point, because we'll get more in. I will abuse my moderator's uh, place by asking the first one, if I may. I spent a year uh, in a Hertfordshire village in 1957 and 58, um, I, having grown up in London before that, uh, I was seven and eight years old at the time. I spent the whole of the year collecting birds' eggs and pinning butterflies and harvesting the incredible rich di biodiversity which coexisted uh, with farming in Hertfordshire at that time. And it was because of the farming system and the soil was healthy, the crops were healthy, and there was amazing biodiversity. And do you know what? There wasn't a single stewardship or habitat management scheme in place. The reason why all that stuff was there was because the farming system was working in harmony with nature. And I want to ask you this first question. Do you understand that? And do you understand that if we get to achieve the health and harmony that you strive for, it will not be achieved by more habitat schemes around the edge of otherwise intensively farmed land? And what we really need is changes of farming practice on a systemic level, and which means actually area-based payments if we're going to achieve that. Excuse me to be a bit sharp. <laughs> no, well, I, I think your first point is a, is, a, is, a, is a very powerful one. I think that um, all of us will have experienced during our lifetimes uh, the evidence of, of biodiversity loss. Um, and we see it in all sorts of different metrics. We see it in the way in which, for example, the Farmland Bird Index has shown a dramatic reduction in the number of farmland birds during my adult lifetime. We also see it experienced anecdotally in the way, for example, that a number of people have commented in, 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 the, in the last couple of years about the windscreen factor. The fact that when we were younger and children, our windscreens were thick with um, uh, the, uh, the dead insects, which were a direct consequence of um, successful living farmland. Now, the absence of insects in our fields, which of course has contributed to the absence of farmland birds overall, is visibly or rather invisibly apparent um, in uh, uh, the way in which we uh, uh, see what happens on our windscreens as we drive through the countryside. And there are a number of other examples. And you are right, Patrick, that um, if you have a... Uh, a model of farming, a mixed farming model, um, and Fur Farm, um, as I mentioned earlier, is an exemplar in that respect. Uh, if you have proper rotation, if you have uh, livestock farming alongside arable farming, then you create the circumstances which allow um, biodiversity to flourish and you have a, a, a broader investment in natural capital overall. But I also think that it's right to recognise that there will be uh, landscapes that have to be managed and sustained, and Minette made this point. 
um, which aren't necessarily right for uh, mixed farming in every way. It is the case that there are going to be uh, some parts of our country where uh, grass is really the only thing that, that will grow or should grow, um, uh, and therefore uh, you are going to have to have a form of farming that supports people um, who are relying on grass-fed ruminants as the principal source of their farming income. Beyond that, there are also going to be people who will be managing land, which is not suitable for cultivation of any kind, and you need to think then to what extent should that land be used for sporting use, and to what extent should we also be investing appropriately in forestry, and to what extent should we also be ensuring that people who are responsible for habitats, and I mentioned a couple of them, uh, like Blanket Bog, in my, in my remarks, need support in order to ensure that those habitats are restored. So you're absolutely right that making sure that we support people who want to produce um, food in a sustainable way through mixed farming methods has to be part of what we do, but I don't think that it's the be all and end all. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Richard Smith to ask a question. He's asking it in connection with the Agricology uh, Twitter feed and website, which I think we're, we're feeding in questions, and Richard's going to ask the first of them. Well, firstly, good afternoon, Secretary of State. Minette, thank you very much for your addresses. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did, and we're very excited to hear you talking the way you do. Uh, we have a lot of followers. I'm chairman of the steering group for agroecology, and one question that's been asked uh, considerably is about carrot and stick. So payments to farmers for environmental payments, BPS. How can the government, and indeed the NFU, encourage farmers to look at more sustainable systems. Um, in instances, I manage a rather large organic farm. You mentioned in your address that 3% of the United Kingdom is farmed organically. I meet hundreds of farmers. Um, we are definitely seen as inferior style farmers, and yet our farms are very productive. I mean, that's what I get from farmers. How can government and indeed the NFU help to uh, exchange knowledge and encourage farmers to look at more sustainable systems? Well, I, I think that um, there, are, there are lots of interventions. There are lots of elements in the machine, as it were, um, which, of, of which we need to be uh, aware. The first is, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, there is a, there is a greater than ever consumer interest in where our food comes from. That will have an effect on how people purchase. It will have an effect, therefore, on the outlets that they use. Now, I hope I'm under no illusions. I know that uh, some of the, uh, what are called boutique outlets, that uh, specialize in ensuring that uh, people can have access to the highest quality organic or um, otherwise appropriate and sustainably uh, prepared food, um, uh, don't constitute a significant part of the market yet. But they're growing. And it is also the case that other outlets, supermarkets, um, uh, uh, from the discounters to the more premium supermarkets, also appreciate that consumers, in particular younger consumers, are moving in this direction. So there's a clear market pull. The other thing, of course, though, is that there is a cost for someone who wants to move sometimes from a more in, well, I have to be careful about the adjectives I use, from a particular method of farming towards a more sustainable one. And not everyone necessarily wants to go organic fully. There are lessons that people can draw from the organic movement that people want to adopt, but not necessarily embrace 100%. And I think one of the things that we need to do in DEFRA is to recognize that the process of transition is one which can sometimes involve costs along the way. We need to be sensitive to the costs that people might incur, but also we need to encourage that, because ultimately, the methods of farming, which as Manette points out, are becoming increasingly rare now and are associated with the past. Those methods of farming essentially led to a depletion of natural capital. Those methods of farming meant that over the years, the soil became less fertile. In any given year, making that transition would mean taking a financial hit, and that was always going to be difficult. Ultimately, however, it was a cul-de-sac. Um, farmers realized that, but they also want help to be able to uh, reverse out of that cul-de-sac and to be able to uh, farm in a way that is genuinely sustainable long-term. One of the things that we want to design is a package of support in order to make it easier for farmers to do just that. I, I don't feel I should take up any of the oxygen while you have the Secretary of State here. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's it's best because... Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Evan Marriage, British Wildlife Management. Um, I've got two key points, a uh, little bit of background. I had my first farm to manage in 62 when we were at a peak, this country was at a peak in terms of farmers being able to make a profit and uh, all the quality of the operations going on. We led the world. 
we want to get back to that, so I support everything you've said. It's a question of how we do it. The first issue is we need a level playing field. And one of the things that isn't generally realized is that we will never receive the EU rebate that Maggie Thatcher negotiated at Fontainebleau. And therefore, something like 35, 40 billion pounds never reached the farming industry. That's why they're on welfare, or many of them are on welfare. The second thing is that we have wonderful uplands, something like 50% of the land area of the British Isles is over 500 feet. And what we've been doing with Natural England and other organisations is removing sheep and cattle from those uplands. And it has been a disastrous experience because sheep and cattle are crucial. They're dung and urine, the insects, the soil quality, making the grass grow so they act as sponges. There's a whole world there which we need to put right. And we have to do that by having people at DEFRA who really understand practical farming. Thank you. Well, I, I think there's some very powerful points there. The one thing I would say about the uplands, and I mentioned it in, in the speech, is that um, uh, I think it's impossible to think of um, uh, uh, much of our upland landscape without farmers and farming there in order to ensure that the environment that we cherish survives. But one of the things that I, I think has to be acknowledged is that sometimes in some upland areas, stocking levels in the past were too high, there was overgrazing. I think it's important that a balance is struck. But you are right that in striking the right balance, what we need to do is to work very closely and make the most of the farming expertise and knowledge developed over generations, which um, uh, if we discount or ignore, we end up making policy that, uh, that grates against the, uh, the successful and sustainable use of those landscapes. Thank you. There's a point I think Richard's got a question. Um, yeah. Secretary of State, um, I, I'm sure you're well aware that um, over the last um, several decades, DEFRA uh, has put a lot of money into encouraging farmers to diversify. And one of the options which many of us have chosen has been to, to introduce on-farm retailing and processing of meat. But that depends on having local abattoirs available to slaughter our livestock, and they've been disappearing at an unprecedented rate. My, <laughs> my question is whether you will give consideration to what is a multifaceted problem, but whether you'll give consideration to what can be done to help reverse that situation. Well, I, I have to say the work the Sustainable Food Trust has done in, in highlighting the need for um, a network of, of local abattoirs um, in order to ensure that we can have successful local food economies has been great. And I think getting Countryfile uh, to uh, cover that report in, a, in an incredibly, I thought, thorough and sympathetic way was an achievement. I absolutely understand leaving the European Union gives us an opportunity to look at some of the rules around abattoirs. One of the things I have to say, of course, is that people expect not just that animals will um, uh, lead lives with their welfare cared for, but at the moment that they die, their welfare will be appropriately uh, um, uh, cared for as well. And so the rules that are in place, even though I don't necessarily agree with all of them, were there for the right reasons. It's not an easy process, but I do agree with you that one of the things that would help enormously, actually in terms of animal welfare and in terms of sustaining local food economies, is thinking hard about how we can ensure that um, meat can be uh, 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 finished and uh, uh, animals can be uh, can meet the end of their lives far closer to where they were raised. Um, Secretary of State, uh, Rob Harrison, I'm a local dairy farmer. Um, like many Cotswold farmers, I've um, embraced stewardship. Um, unfortunately, I put a mid-tier application in last year. Uh, five months after it was due to start, I'm still waiting for my paperwork back. Um, I also have issues with a transition from a, from a HLS scheme and the timing into a, into a new mid-tier scheme. Um, and I'm also aware of many colleagues who are still waiting payment for, for the income foregone. Um, so if we're going to have a, a system that, that, that's clearly broken, um, and I'm really concerned that a lot of farmers, farmer stakeholders are going to be disenfranchised and, and angered by what has happened, and, and we're going to stop health and harmony before it's even begun. Well, the first thing I would say is that um, I'm, I'm all too well aware of the way in which countryside stewardship has not, um, not worked as it should have done. And over the course of the, uh, the time that I've been at DEFRA, um, we have been working with Natural England, with James Cost, the chief executive, and the, the chairman, Andrew Sells, who is, I think, here today, in order to see what it is that we can do to put things right. Um, and one of the things that I want to do is 
um, after we've completed a piece of work which should be completed in the next few weeks, um, which should be an exercise in uh, simplifying and streamlining uh, the process of getting money out the door, I want to make sure that um, uh, we have James and Andrew, myself and George Eustace, in a room with a, a representative cross-section of people who've experienced the frustrations that you've mentioned, so we can take you through what it is that we hope to do, how it is that we intend to change things, so that you can feel, and hopefully you will receive your money by then, that actually uh, we understand what it requires to be changed. Um, and if you'd like to join um, that, um, that seminar uh, a little bit later this year, then I'd be delighted to extend the invitation to you as well. Right, now I'm being, I'm being pressured because I think that you have to leave quite soon. But can, sure, can yes. I take one more of course, round of absolutely. questions? Yes, Maybe absolutely. I could take three. Yes. Uh, please. Uh, Jonathan Brunny, local organic and pasture fed farmer, another one in the room. Uh, many of us believe that grass fed should mean 100% yes. grass fed. Do you agree with that? Or, and what are you going to do about it? Uh, I do, as it, matters, as it, as it happens. Um, and the point was made forcibly to me um, by uh, Bill Wigan, uh, who, as I'm sure you know, is a. Um, a great champion for um, uh, uh, pasture-fed livestock. Um, we are going to change labelling overall, um, and we have an opportunity outside the European Union to do that. One of the aspects of um, future farming policy in which we're consulting at the moment is how we do that. Um, I don't want to take anything away from, and Minette mentioned already, the success of Red Tractor in improving animal welfare, the, uh, the work of LEAF in making sure that we do the right thing are recognised for it. But we can go further and we can develop a, a gold standard system of labelling that does exactly what you say and emphasises both that uh, pasture fed should um, mean what it says, but also that there are other virtues that uh, farmers um, uh, embody in the work that we do every day that deserve to be recognised so that customers, when they're buying British and buying quality, know that what they're getting is British and quality and that uh, we take a Ron Seal approach towards labelling. Um, and that what it says on the label reflects what's in the packet. I want to apologise to all the many, many people who would like to ask questions, and we're, I'm just stuck between the pressure of... Um, have you got another five minutes? Yes, absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Gove, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for the opportunity. Uh, Mr Gove, mine's a very short point, really. Your department is doing a lot of fact-finding and consultation, which I think is first class, thank you. Uh, we've all been a part of that. Um, but I, we're all really worried about how you're going to decide on policy because you won't be able to please everybody. Mm. No, I won't. And I, um, I, I won't say that it doesn't worry me. But one of the things that uh, I, 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 I'm trying to do is to make sure that we have the, the widest possible range of views. It's why in the speech um, I explicitly acknowledge that we need to have um, as many voices as possible in the consultation. Um, and I think that there will be... Um, I, I, I make the point that I think that there's no, ten no tension, no necessary tension between the goals of uh, a healthy and productive uh, 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 food producing farming sector and a healthy environment. But there will be trade-offs because you can only spend a pound once and if we decide to subsidise and support particular types of activity, there'll be others who feel that they were deserving recipients um, and they, they'll see the money going elsewhere. So I do recognise that, but I hope that when um, we make those decisions that um, uh, fair-minded people will be able to judge objectively that the reasoning behind it, even if they don't necessarily always agree with it, is at least soundly based. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Kelly. I'm from Tideford Abattoir, one of the remaining 60 small abattoirs in England. Um, I have a question regarding animal welfare. Um, there's been a lot of call recently uh, for production methods to be stated on packaging for the consumers mm. to make educated choices. Um, my concern is with um, stunned and unstunned slaughter um, and the welfare implications of that. Um, being a small avatar, we are very, very welfare driven um, and I have a lot of customers um, who actively, you know, they, they come out and ask um, if we're involved in religious slaughter or not um, and then use us as a result that we don't. Um, what I would like to know is if there are any plans in the future to put animal welfare above that of religion. Well, um, I, I was asked about this in the, in the House of Commons on, um, uh, on yeah, just yesterday, death for questions. Um, I think that one of the things that it's important in Britain to recognise is that we're a country of, with people from many backgrounds and many faiths. This is an area where we do have to tread sensitively. I do take animal welfare issues, I hope people appreciate very, very seriously. Um, but we do have to reflect carefully on this. George Eustace and I have been thinking and talking to a number of people 
about these issues, but I don't want to say any more than that at this stage because these are necessarily delicate and sensitive matters. And we need to, if, 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 if we are going to say or do anything in this area, we need to make sure that we do get it right because there are some people who, whatever you do in this area, uh, as we all know, there are sensitivities out there. There's some, I know, I know it's no one in this room, but there are some people outside who, who would want to exploit this issue. Just very briefly, um, yeah, look, it's a very, very important area. Um, <laughs> our advice, because we feel very strongly about it, if you are red chapter assured, it is all stunned. And that is our line. We don't support individual labelling. I think the Secretary of State has made a very good point around we are multicultural Britain. We have to respect that, but farm assured, red chapter is all stunned. Um, I want, before you go, to at least uh, give Joel just a, a quick word. Joel's built soil over 60 years. On his, he's America's most famous livestock farmers, and, and he's uh, built soil through farming practice. And I'm particularly interested personally in how you're going to incentivize that. So I thought Joel might have something to say, or about something else. Uh, well, I would just, um, I would say that lots of times um, the incentives that the government has to give are to counteract the hurdles that it puts in our way. It's, and um, I happen to co-own a slaughter, a federal inspector slaughterhouse in the US, small community, you know, 18 employees. And um, we also process uh, birds on the farm. And I would just like to make a point that as much as we've talked about farming, farmers are in a context, they don't live in a vacuum uh, they are part of a context of the consuming public, and the public doesn't want live chickens. They don't want live cows. They want dead cows and dead chickens. And, 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 and getting that to them, uh, there's a lot of innovation here, and the principle of innovation means that there has to be wiggle room for prototypes to come to, to, to fruition. If an embryo has to be too big to be birthed, it can't be birthed. Yes. And so when you have regulations of, of, of infrastructure that are scale prejudicial, that creates unfair playing fields for innovators trying to join the marketplace. And, um, and I, I certainly sense it in this room that there's an overwhelming desire for, um, for uh, wiggle room, um, forget infrastructure, just go to empirical tests, take a swab test. If you, can, you know, if you can butcher a chicken cleanly in a kitchen sink and it meets the swab test, who cares if it's wrapped in a $500,000 facility? And suddenly you create access for embryonic entrepreneurs that can actually create local food systems. And, and but you're, we, the, the points are very powerful. I think the first thing is, yes, you're all right. There are a number of rules um, which exist and regulations which exist, which in, inhibit innovation and inhibit the uh, um, new entrants. Um, and one of the things that we need to look at is which of those rules are there for good reasons, and which of those rules that are there were, were well-intentioned but have subsequently become gold-plated. Um, but we have to proceed with care. I mean, you are right that um, um, without that innovation, then we won't have what people often want, which is a high-quality, locally-produced food that, um, uh, uh, that people believe in and are prepared to pay a premium for in many cases. I just said a couple of other things prompted by your, your question, which is that um, um, we are seeing in, in the UK, and it's, 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 it's a very, very small part of farming, but it's an important one. New entrants from people who've never been involved in farming before, and I think we both want to welcome that. And you can have people, for example, who, won't, who don't need to buy land, but will often, um, for example, um, uh, invest in livestock to grow on other people's land. It's part of a, um, a process which I, I think we want to encourage. The second thing, and I know that I'm taking your words slightly out of context, is you said that people don't want live animals, they want the the, the, the meat and the, and the produce at the end of it. I'll, I'll, I'll use that question to make two points. The first thing is, I think it's very, very important for me to stress that um, when people worry about diet, 
and I touched on it for public health reasons earlier, that a truly balanced diet includes meat, um, and that we do need to ensure, while respecting individual choice, that people appreciate that um, it's not just the case that a truly balanced diet includes meat, balanced mixed farming includes livestock farming. And that takes me to another point as well. The, 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 the British landscape is impossible to, to think of, impossible to appreciate, impossible to sustain without animals on it. Um, and you know, there are some people who do take a purist view, um, but um, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just in the uplands, but it's in areas like the Norfolk Broads, but again, without appropriate grazing, you don't have the balanced approach towards environmental goods and natural capital that we want to see. So I don't think any of these issues are easy. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there will be, I'm sure, some trade-offs that we will get wrong. But I think that the heart of your basic insight, which is try to strip back and simplify in order to allow farmers who love what they do to do the right thing, that has to be our right impulse. Unless you're prepared to stay a few more minutes. I think there's one gentleman there okay. who, I'm, who I think very much wants to ask a question. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll have to... Yes, I'll Just a little idea. Um, yes. and you may have mentioned this. I haven't read your document. Yes, sure. Well done, I will do. Um, Thank you. <laughs> as I understand, we're about 350 parts per million CO2 in the environment. Yes. It's getting a bit dangerous. Is that right? Uh, I, I wouldn't like I to... Well, anyway, it's, it's getting dangerous, yes. Yeah. yes. Why do we pay farmers carbon credits? So if they do a restorative type of farming, yes. and they increase their organic matter in the soil, you reward them on the BPS, or well, single farm well, payment. If they detract from it, then reduce it. And then you encourage carbon sequestration. Yeah. That, was, that was my last question too. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly the, the good, straightforward, practical idea which incentivizes Farms do the right thing, and which is good for the environment, but we do want to have the consultation, so thank you. Okay. Secretary of State, thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. not over and to all of you who were frustrated towards the back of the hall who still have questions uh, now's the time and uh, Vanessa are you okay to continue uh, with this session absolutely fine um, uh, I'm thrilled because I think that um, whilst it would have been nice if the Secretary of State could have stayed a lot longer uh, he's busy he's got his next engagement to go to and I think we should take this opportunity of exploring some of the issues that have already come up and raising some more with Minette, whose, whose influence on the Secretary of State is obviously going to be considerable. Um, and as a member of the National Farmers Union, I, and I know many of you are as well, uh, we can lobby you. So, uh, who wants to, who wants to I ask? I see, that's a, this is a mass lobby. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, it's a mass lobby. Uh, so please, next, can somebody going around with the microphone? Yeah, the back. Oh, somebody got, got the yeah. microphone? Okay, okay, thank yeah. you. Where are you? Hi. Back right. Oh, good. Hi. Hello. I've got a question about um, cheap food. You mentioned um, earlier on that we were only spending 11 or 12 percent of household income on food now, whereas in the 1950s it was more over 40 percent. My question is whether that's necessarily a good thing, and whether we ought to be um, sp maybe spending more on food. But somebody, somebody else asked about a level playing field, and you know whether we're sub, you know. It, things are subsidised, things are taxed. That's the way of the world, and it's always going to be the way of the world. And I think what's coming out is ideas about different That's ways that we can get closer to, you know, towards full cost accounting, where we recognise all of the public costs of what we do and the public benefits of what we do. So uh, I'm just wondering whether we could sum up a lot of what we're saying by but by saying that what our goal maybe ought to be is to make good food affordable so that the market does then have a role in that. Does that make any sense? Uh, th th there's a lot of stuff in uh, what you're saying. So, you know, the point I was trying to make is we don't need the, these wider trade deals with countries with different standards, with 
some cases, lower standards uh, to have cheaper food. You know, food has never been cheaper in this country. And, and I would share uh, what I think is a level of your frustration that actually, you know, asking the question is, is that a good thing? Um, it is a good thing for the 50% of consumers I talked about who are on really restricted incomes, um, who have every right uh, to have quality, affordable, traceable food, the same as anybody else does. Um, I think the challenge is the UK market is globally unique. So we have a, 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 a real challenge now, I believe, with uh, retailers, the rise of the discounters, they've all been incredibly successful. Um, they've all, many of them, built businesses, particularly the discounters, on British production because they know that that pulls people in um, and then when they're in the store they will buy other things as well. But, but British has been absolutely key to the rise of Aldi. Um, you look at the co-op that's gone to 100% fresh, going to 100% frozen. Now, you know, we could think that that is, that is nice to be back in British farming like that, but they are doing it because the consumer is, is demanding that, is wanting that, is wanting to be able to buy local, is wanting to have short, safe, secure supply chains. But what is happening is that you are having ever more outlets. So LD have plans for another 200 more stores. Um, so you are living now with a very, very savage retail price war. But don't you think that behind this question, I don't know if you're aware of our report, The Hidden Cost of UK Food, which Richard Young um, wrote and was published in November. And the headline was that for every pound we spend on food in this country, there's a hidden pound um, in, in negative externalities or damage to the environment and public health. And we've quantified and monetized where those costs are. Don't you think that the, behind that question was uh, the need for an honest price to food, which reflects its true production costs, which means back to the Secretary of State, he's talking about the polluter pays principle. Would you, would you support the introduction of polluter pays principle corrections to these distortions which we've identified in the report? Well, now, now, we had a big question there. We've now got a huge question here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, look, until we start tracing pollutants, Patrick, we can't, how can we, how can we tax or, or demonise the polluter if we're not tracing them? But, but let me just finish with this, because it's a really, yeah. really important question. Um, so you, you've got that, that massive challenge. You then, as I said, you then have social regulation, national living wage, business rates. That has driven a coach and horses to a very, very challenged marketplace. Now you speak to any of the retailers, I speak to all of the chief execs on a regular basis, they are absolutely um, uh, so concerned about price rises in food because it drives footfall. So, you know, they are determined that we will keep food prices uh, where they are. They don't want to see them rising. They want to talk about sustainable production. I think everybody is actually recognising that, you know, we have one planet. Uh, and certainly in this country, as I said, you know, every single farm part of the UK has an environmental responsibility. Every farmer should be an environmentalist as well. But this market in the UK is unique. So anything like that, Patrick, you would have to have impact assessments. You would have to know yeah. what you're talking about. But it, it, it's, it's a big challenge and it's pretty unique to the UK. Well, impact assessments, uh, accurate uh, tracing of the pollution, yep, absolutely. But if that was the case, then you would have a more honest food pricing system. And perhaps that the problem with <coughs> you've identified with retailers wanting to keep food cheap is that it's been a race to the bottom. And as long as the food is dishonestly priced, it's impossible for retailers and food companies to source more sustainably because the price gap is too big. Look, I've been, spent two days in Brussels reassuring uh, European farmers that we do not want a race to the bottom on standards. We want to maintain our standards. Absolutely, we want to maintain our standards of food safety, of environmental protection, of animal welfare. That is paramount to, to British farmers' uh, future. But, you know, there is a real challenge here. We are working, we are leaving one protectionist trading block. Um, and you and I believe actually in creating a, another protectionist trading block as far as food goes, because we believe in our standards. But there is a real challenge there. And as we start to source out of a globalised market, the market will always win. So what we mustn't do is to drive British production out of the, the, the consumer base, you know, that the market will out and we have to be mindful of that. But there are things that we can do um, and we are better together. We are. <laughs> uh, who's next? Somebody got the mic? Oh, good.
Thank you. Um, you. You said that we've never propped up inefficient farmers. Um, I spend every year looking at my profit and loss account to work out where I'm being inefficient, and trying to get better and better. Uh, the consultation documents say that only one in three farmers have a profit and loss account. So how do we even know who's inefficient or not? The, the challenge is now, uh, when you expect a, a UK taxpayer to, to be investing the new deal that I talked about, we've got to look at becoming as, as efficient as we can. So I am constantly, you know, we have 100 suckler cows. I need every one of those cows to have a live calf every year. I have to have the highest health status I possibly can in order to achieve that. I need every one of my sheep to have a minimum of two lambs every year. So we have to be, and it is right to be challenging ourselves to be efficient, to be the best. Um, so I'm very much talking about the future. Um, we have to be ambitious for that future, but focusing on our, on our efficiencies. You know, what I said about productivity, uh, UK versus Denmark. Um, you know, that, that is something that really has to be addressed. You know, we, we have to be able to achieve more out of what we're doing by smarter farming. Now, farmers get pretty annoyed, uh, and understandably so, when, you know, people are telling them to become more competitive, uh, to become more efficient, and, you know, the end game, as has been raised here, is ever challenging. You know, what I said about no fruit and veg rises in the last 15 years, that's pretty much the same across all sectors. And that, at the end of the day, is why agriculture is supported, and rightly so. And it is very different across the world. But don't misinterpret everything I said. All I would say to other farmers, as I challenge myself, is let's make sure our businesses are as efficient as they can be, because that way they will be more profitable and productive going forward. Thank you. The next... Question. Yeah, I carefully read uh, Michael Gove's paper, the consultation document, and frankly, I didn't recognise a great deal in that document, which he actually said from the podium, frankly. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is the consultation questions, for example. The first question, he says, is to this huge change in farming, is please rank the following ideas for simplification of the current CAP, develop further simplified packaging. That seems to be the first question he asks. The second is, do you want these application form simplified? Then it goes on, talking about the agricultural transition, and fundamentally, the first question is, is what's the best way of applying reductions to direct payments? It goes on like that. It really isn't a visionary document, in my view. Um. I think it is a visionary document, but I think it is a social and environmental visionary document that does not have any meat on the bones at, at all. Um, so we feel very, very strongly that food production you know, must drive the agenda. I say to the many farmer meetings that I do, I see this as a negotiation right now. You know, we are negotiating a new deal first and foremost with our government. Um, food security has not been taken seriously. You could argue that it hasn't had to be while we've been members of the European Union. It does need to be taken seriously now. So this is a new deal. Um, the public money is for public goods. I think government has a responsibility to make sure that the marketplace works. Um, and certainly achieving fair trading principles. We've all tried the voluntary codes across dairy and across meat, many dairy farmers uh, in the audience today. And they don't work. They won't work. So there is a lot of work to be done, and without progressive, thriving, profitable, food-producing businesses, that paper goes nowhere. So that is what the basis of this discussion has to be about. But I, I do see it as, as a period of negotiation, shaping a new deal. Um, we have to raise our game, and government, in turn, has to raise its game as well. I want to just check, how many people in this room are directly involved in some way or another with farming? Oh, wow, that's great. So that is incredible. I don't know what the area of land represented here is, but it's very significant. And I want to ask a second question for you, mm -hmm. which is how many of the farmers here would appreciate it if the result of the DEFRA consultation and its implementation, because I agree with your analysis of it, it's short on, you know, it's short on the flesh. It's very short on the uh, If it was to shift the balance of profitability to enable the kind of mixed farming systems that the Secretary of State was highlighting to be more profitable than they are at the moment, would that be a good outcome of the consultation process? Because I think it's a systemic shift. This is my opinion, but I feel it's echoed in the room that's needed, not just a whole plethora more 
of stewardship, bits and pieces around the edges. What do you think about that? Well, who would agree with my question first? Do you feel that that's what we've got to do, shift it so that it becomes more, more possible? Because if that's the case, how, you, I feel we should work together to make that possible. We need a sound business case for truly sustainable farming. We haven't got it at the moment. Uh, look, Patrick, I mean, that when I see the Secretary of State one-to-one, -one, you know, the, the most important thing that I want him to do is to treat British agriculture as a business. You know, it's all very well to have aspirational uh, ideologies in place that, that sound great, but treat it as a business because each and every one of you are an independent business. And you are what shapes this fabulous landscape that we have here today. So we believe it has to be outcomes focused. It has to be underpinned by science and evidence based policy. But you have to look at the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And you have to have food production at the heart of that. Yes, it food. doesn't it doesn't have that in that paper. yet. No, but yet. food production using methods which increase biodiversity and soil fertility at the heart, not round the edges. Look, we all want healthier soils. We all want better biodiversity. We all want an environment um, that flourishes. You know, I think we all agree with those things. Tracy. Tracy Worcester from the campaign Farms Not Factories. <laughs> I heard you say we wanted to protect. Hey, let's get that word protect out of the bin and stop this global trade from undermining prices from our farmers. So we focus on pigs. And at the moment, there are laws out there. They have to have a manipulatable material, so they act naturally, and then they're not supposed to be routinely tail docked, which they only have to have because they start eating each other in frustration. And yet, Britain and none of the other EU countries are following that law. Nobody obeys that law. So you continually get ever bigger factory pig farms. So now they're in Northern Ireland, uh, certainly, as he pointed out, in Herefordshire, and I mean, it's just, they are growing like mushrooms in the rain. Can you tell me how we can protect our farmers from cheap imports if people like Liam Fox get yes. his way? <laughs> well, in the first instance, and I think very encouragingly, that as we approach the whole Brexit process, um, we are four countries, one nation. We are four governments. Uh, and therein lies a massive challenge. But I can tell you that right across the devolved nations as well, they feel as strongly about that as we do here in England, that our high standards should not be undermined by lower production methods from other countries. But there is a huge challenge here, and, and our concern with the Health and Harmony paper, and suddenly sort of ripping up the old rule book, creating a new rule book, before we even know who our trading partner is gonna be. Um, government is divided on the future of this, but the biggest impactor on each and every business in this room is getting a bad trade deal, is getting a trade deal that, that throws British agriculture under the bus. That, that's the biggest impactor. That's what will shape the landscape more than anything else. So, you know, I, I don't have the answer to it because we're leaving one protectionist trading block and there will be opposition to creating another one. But I think as far as food goes, we should all stick very strongly together and make sure that our standards are not undermined by different standards of production from other countries um, that perform to, as I say, different levels of production. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions here. I think Phil Stocker. Oh, you're first, are you? I'm yes, there we go. I'm Phil. first. Yes. I didn't catch the minister, but uh, knowing what happens to DEFRA consultations, I have here in my hand 2003, a DEFRA consultation matching abattoir and slaughter services to farmers' needs. The minister did not know it even existed, and I would ask that they certainly look at it. And this is probably treading on tomorrow's subject. But this is a very large document that the ministry paid a lot of money for and nothing has happened to it. Well, we'll make sure that doesn't happen after tomorrow's session. Um, <laughs> Phil Stocker and then Trisha Ross in front. The conversation moved on slightly, but I just wanted to come back on the point that the gentleman in the middle made about some of those very first questions in the consultation document. And that is that um, we've now got a 25-year environment plan that I don't think was consulted on very widely, but 
we've got it. Uh, we're working on a, an agricultural bill, a consultation process through a, for, towards an agricultural bill, and we hear that we're going to work at some stage on a coherent food policy. I think it's a bit of a shame that all those things haven't been done together. I don't think uh, it all is lost at the moment, because I think we've still got the chance to connect them all together. I think it is a real shame that they've not been working in tandem. But coming back to the point that the gentleman in the middle made, we do need a, 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 a really good and effective transition, and that's what those questions in the consult consultation are about. How we make that transition in as easy a way and a way that causes as least disruption as possible. And I think that the, the, um, the consultation document is visionary, um, and we've got some big changes that we need to make, but we need some time, boy do we need some time, and do people need some support to, to make that change? And that transition I think we need to be patient with, and I would like to see all sides of the farming industry uh, in a way try to come together to help the industry as a whole make that change, and that's what that transition is about. Thank you. Can we have Trisha's point as well? Uh, right in front of Phil. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, Michael Gove did say that anybody can email him if they weren't able to ask the question here in the room. Oh, well, that's a good offer. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, take, let's take that up because that's, you know, he's listening. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Uh, Jenny Phelps, Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. Um, in that transition, I'd really like to ask whether the NFU is aware of all the options under high-level stewardship, for example, expiring high-level stewardship agreements, that could be catastrophic if they aren't picked up in that transition. I know, Patrick, you're passionate about saying the wildlife shouldn't be around the edges of the farm fields, uh, and we all want to see you know, soil building and those in-field options, which actually are brilliant under countryside stewardship, even though the mechanisms are a bit complicated. Um, is that actually in Gloucestershire alone we've got between 30 and 40,000 hectares of options around fields at the moment on which wildlife is currently depending. And there is a huge risk if that isn't picked up in the transition, it will be catastrophic for wildlife. And we do need to make sure in that period, as the gentleman said, that we allow the countryside to adapt. So I think there's recently been an appeal by the Foundation for Common Land, for which I'm a trustee, that all the HLS are expiring on, on common land. They, we've got over 210 expiries the next year and the year after, and something must pick up those options. So just please all do be aware that farmers want to keep their wildlife and they want to be supported through that period, I'm sure. Thank you. Look, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I know Andrew Sells is, is in the in the room, and I know he feels very strongly about it as chairman of Natural England. You know, my neighbour is in that very same position. Uh, his HLS is coming to an end. Um, he's been told that he's got a two-year wait before he can get into the next scheme. What what is meant to happen in that period of time? I, I would disagree slightly, um, if I can, Patrick, with what we have created with our margins round fields, with the connection. And if you look at what the Game and Wildlife Conservancy Trust have done, uh, in my area, we're part of 57,000 um, acres of cluster farms, which has all been about joining up corridors, which is very much in line with the Lawton Report, which is about productive farming, uh, being aligned with the environment. But it is no good having this little haven if that haven isn't connected. So the more we create corridors, the more we can work together. I think you know what GWCT have done has been transformative. It's all been voluntary, um, but it has really driven change. And it's all been about what is flourishing on your farm. Uh, and these, I've invited the non-executive DEFRA board, the new board, out to see this cluster group. Um, because these are just ordinary working farmers. Um, and it has been transformational what they have achieved. Um, uh, the more we can get people out and engage, the better, and show what we're doing. But I like, absolutely, please raise your concerns with Andrew. I'm not going to point him out, because otherwise you'll be mobbed, Andrew. But I can see... You have already, have you? Right, well done. <laughs> uh, we are at the end of the session. Are there one or two last burning questions? Have you got one question? And also, Minette, uh, would you like to take emails from all the unanswered questions? <laughs> uh, well, I welcome emails. My inbox is, is always jam packed. Um, but I, I, anybody who wants to email me is more than welcome to email me. And then become an NFU member on the back of it. Yeah. As to the question of who the blues pays, the use of nitrogen fertiliser 50% gets only taken at my plant. Either the rest of it gets down in water course 
society has to pay or in the air, atmosphere, global warming. So the easiest thing for polluter pays is somehow put an extra tax on nitrogen. We don't need it. Take it out of our system, please. Well, look, no farmer, no farmer wants to have nitrate in the water course. You know, it is in every farmer's interest to not have nitrate that costs a fortune getting into the water course. So, you know, I think there's a real challenge in what I said around not exporting our conscience, you know, making sure that we are farming uh, smartly, that we are innovating, that we are targeting, um, that we are really making sure that we are driving a, a step change. In, in how we farm. But, you know, just cutting out nitrogen. You know, nitrogen, with the best one in the world, without sounding too crude, which is going to, you know, nitrogen out of a bag or nitrogen out of a cow, you know, is, is no different. It's about the effective use of nitrogen. Just tax the nitrogen usage and then it'll slow it down. Nitrogen usage, what, and tax dairy it, farmers for? Uh, no, no, the, the bad nitrogen, because that's the most not not used correctly. And I was at Elverton Farms the other day and looking oh, at. Fifty percent gets taken up. You know, the automatic goes elsewhere. You cannot. That's a fact of how. If you're t work. if you're using it correctly. So what I was saying about Elverton Farms Estate that produces is on contract for producing potatoes for McDonald's and for all those people that see the little chips sticking out the top of the. The, the package, that is how they have to be produced because that's what the consumer wants, chips that are that long, that come out of the packet by that much. And seeing the machine that they are using, that is planting potatoes, putting a tiny little bit of, of fertiliser in with the potato, so that the moment that starts to grow, that takes it up. You know, that is what we want to see. That is the future. That is about productivity that is really driving a step change in how we produce food efficiently. Nobody wants to see nitrate in the watercourses. You know, those are days of the past. You know, this is going to be a, a forwards thinking uh, farming industry. And, you know, the new technologies that are available that mean you can target. When I say we've halved our use of inorganic fertilizer, that is because we've been targeting our approach. The cost of fertilizer, who wants to waste it? But, but that's so the majority of the people still spread it on their area, on, their, on land area. So we have to. If you want to do that, either support the other farmers to go that way, or just somehow to reduce. Yeah, but but look, just be really, really mindful of all this. We are we are a highly regulated country, and a lot of people have been talking about a step back from from regulation. Uh, and, and smaller abattoirs, and I can absolutely see where you're coming from, but we are highly regulated. We have one of the safest food systems in the world. If we export our production and our standards abroad, we will open our doors, which I think everybody is opposed to, to food produced to lower standards, to different levels of production. Um, you know, you look at the challenges in New Zealand where they haven't had any NVZ regulation and their water quality. You know, and you benchmark that against ours, it's incomparable. So we mustn't demonise what we're doing here because we'll export our production and our conscience and our standards. We've got to make sure that what we are doing is recognised. And I agree, as smart as possible. Maybe this is, a, this is not a lobbying exercise, but... Um, uh, Isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, is, there is a voice, and it's been expressed by my colleague Richard Young in our Hidden Costs of UK Food Report, mm -hmm. articulating, the, articulating the case for ensuring that the polluter pays in relation to nitrogen. Who in this room, representing a lot of farmers' mind, would be supportive of some sort of mechanism, it could be a carrot or a stick or both, which assured that the externalised damage caused by nitrogen fertiliser was charged for at the point of use or before it. So there's a message. There's a message, but, but don't forget, you know, we, we are not tracing pollutants. You know, our septic tanks are out of date. Um, we have massive challenges going on out there, so, so don't demonise all of you as, as farmers. Let's do the whole package and let's work out where these pollutants are coming from. We have no regulation around sustainable urban drainage. We have a massive issue yeah. with runoff. And we as farmers, you know, we have taken the bulk of the risk. We do the majority of the work. And I don't see why we should take all the blame. It's not, we is us, isn't it? It is us, but, yes. but actually there is a the whole host of things that need to happen um, before we start, you know, putting all the blame 
uh, on farmers. I, no one should blame the farmers. In, this is my opinion now. I think farmers of this country have been responding to the economic environment in which we operate. We are highly regulated. And we that need, is the difference. We need the economic incentives to shift to allow us to farm more in harmony <coughs> with nature than has been possible in the past. We, look, we all agree on We that. agree. <laughs> I think this is... Uh, the there, yes, you've got the microphone. Have you yet got it? Or the, no, somebody before then. Okay, this is there. Um, Lorna Davis, uh, I come off an Upland Hill farm where intensification of agriculture is coming through poultry and through muck. Uh, sorry, the um, uh, effects being muck and also dairy as well. I'm currently studying a Nuffield scholarship on the value of managing water in agriculture and I've just been out to New Zealand to see how they perform with regards to quality. I'm also a sustainable drainage designer, so um, foot in both camps. I just want to say in terms of pollution in watercourses, a lot of it is not due to farming and it is up to us as farmers to ensure that we do make sure that we are pushing for mapping exercises to be able to better understand your catchment as a whole because you're not the only people who live in there and you provide a risk but you provide an opportunity to help quality water quality. The other thing I wanted to say is we're looking at a project in Wales which is to do with muck which we consider a byproduct not a waste product which we are struggling to be able to use in our landscape because we don't have the type of growing regime to be able to use it and actually opportunities of innovation which is in the sewage industry which could be transferred into the agricultural industry to then be able to make that muck a transportable product elsewhere is something which we might be able to then utilise as a way to get a profit into your upland areas and not a loss. It's been done in Holland. As I say, it's been done in the sewage industry. It is about enabling farmers to be in, in charge of their change, their direction of change, and ensuring that they actually look to the future as being custodians of their landscape and not at the... Not at the um, what's the word I'm looking for now? Come on, someone else. <laughs> Not at the vulnerability of the mass population, which is the urban population's voice as to what they think they're doing, not what they're actually doing. Well, can I just applaud what you've just said? Because mm. you are absolutely spot on, and I look forward to reading your Nuffields. You know, this has to be about a whole catchment approach. And everybody has to share that ambition. And I feel very strongly that farmers are the solution, which is what you've highlighted in all of this, um, rather than constantly being portrayed as, as the problem. Yeah. Um, who's got the microphone now? I do. <laughs> uh, the gentleman here who's been waiting for ages. Oh dear. I think he's the last, because we've got to go on to the next session. I, I, I think that the vision to which um, which Michael Gove has of, of the future of farming and land ownership is, is remarkably similar, really, to centuries of previous farming and land ownership. I don't think there's anything particularly new there. Um, I don't think that, um, I may have a short memory, but I don't think that Margaret Beckett invented good conservation and land stewardship when she became DEFRA secretary. I think it had been going on for a few years before that. Um, but really, I don't know the question from Annette really. How do we persuade government that the vision which Michael Gove has has to be paid for? It's not going to be paid for if we really um, destroy the main agricultural, commercial agricultural base we have in this country. If 10% of the consumers will pay a premium for their food, um, if we carry on in the way that is suggested, I, I would think that we're going to increase our food price, cost of production in this country. It's got to be paid for somehow. I doubt whether the government will actually want food prices to go up. Um, and therefore, I suspect we'll export a huge amount of our agricultural production in this country. And it really will just be exporting a problem, as we mentioned elsewhere, that we have um, in this country, elsewhere in the world. And presumably, we become a national park. How do we persuade government that we need a commercial, profitable agriculture to pay for all the good outcomes which we all want? Uh, well, look, 
a commercial, profitable, thriving agriculture is, is absolutely the ambition. When I talk about this as being a period of negotiation, yes it is, because food has been taken for granted and food security has not been an issue for any government. It needs to be now because we are facing the, the biggest step change in all of our lifetimes uh, by coming out of the European Union. So, you know, we cannot just have the future may not be about uh, uh, tariff-free trade going forwards. It might look very, very different. Um, and we have a population of 65 million. So food security has to be taken uh, very seriously uh, now. And I think, you know, the challenge that farmers face, we are quite fragmented uh, in the way we put our points across. We are effectively a very small uh, voice in the bigger scheme of things. You talk about the budget. I mean, I'm amazed how many people get very concerned about can we make a case for the budget? You know, three billion pounds, it would run government, central government and its departments for two and a half days. Even if we only dealt with 20% of food waste, we'd have the budget. Um, have we and can we deliver a phenomenal return on investment? Absolutely, we can. But only if government will focus on this as a business and make commercial decisions. And we will rise to that challenge if they look at it as a business. But if we separate the two, uh, and this is my concern, if I'm honest with you, about public money is for public goods and just say, well, the market can get on and look after itself. It can't operate like that. It's got to be about a shared ambition for food production and enhancing the, the environment as well. That is absolutely paramount to success. Now, if we all stick together across the devolved nations as well, and we are really focused at this through the lens of food, through the lens of the consumer, I think we can make it happen. But believe you me, if we fragment and start pitching environment against food, it won't work. It's got to be about the two together, and it's got to be commercially focused and treat us as a business. Thank you. We've overrun a little bit. Um, and in a moment, we're going to transition. Sorry. Oh. Did you want to have a short break now um, just to say there's tea, tea coffee at the back of the room but also in the barn across the way so do spread out but if we could come back in 25 minutes so 10 past four that would be great but before you go <laughs> I just want to say this to Burnett you've been open you've been honest you've been uh, very courageous in just handling the questions and it's wonderful to have a woman at the helm of the NFU I know that you know I think it is